NBA ASAP. NBA ASAP. Let's go through the spreadsheet. And just first, before we start, let's just uh, review the, uh, how the, the financial statements and how they, how they interconnect. So how many financial statements are there? How many? Three. Three. Three that we're talking about. There, there's, there's, you know, and that, that's really the main industry. And what are they? Balance sheet, income statement, income statement. Cash flow. and cash flow. Excellent. Okay. So you know what? You know this. You're ninety percent of the way there. And I'm going to put another balance sheet here because balance sheets are, are, uh, yeah, they're, they're basically think of the. The income statement is bookended by two balance sheets. Balance sheets are a snapshot in time. They're at one date. That's the thing. So usually have a beginning of the year, and it can be any date, but you know, we'll, well, let's say, and a fiscal year can be any time of the year. But we're going to say December 31st. That's the end of the year. Or we'll say January 1st is the beginning of the year, right? And then December 31st will be the end of the year. So we're going to have two balance sheets. And then we're going to have the income statement is what happens over time. So that'll be over, it can be over a month, it can be over a week, it can be over a quarter. Um, September 30th is usually the end of the third quarter, so that would be the end of the, the third 10Q for publicly reporting companies. And publicly reporting companies get 45 days from the end of their quarter to report their 10Q because they have to collect all the data, put it together. So they usually come out November 15th. And then you get 90 days to do your 10K. So if your end of your year is December 31st, you have till the end of March to get out your, your 10K, which really crams you because then you have to do your first quarter by April 15th and you have your 10K done by March 31st. So it's really, you know, that, that's when it's crunch time for the, plus then it's usually tax time too and reporting taxes, it's crunch time for the, accounting, the accountants in a business. So you have these balance sheets and the income statement, and then the cash flow statement is what reconciles the income statement to cash, the, the profit to cash. And that's because we have all these non-cash uh, transactions that are reported in the income statement. And the reason we do that is because we want to do what's called the matching principle. We want to match a, uh, a sale with, with the revenue that's collected. And so that's the important, that's the key thing because then it really makes sense as a, uh, as a uh, transaction. That's called the matching principle. That's a, that's a big part of, of accounting. And over time we have, and this is called then accrual accounting, where we have all these accounts that accrue the expenses or the revenues or the depreciation relative to when we made those expenses or booked that revenue. And over time, um, these two things will match up. It's just over in the, in the short term, there's a little bit difference between when you're going to recognize revenue and when you're actually going to get the cash in, when you're going to recognize an expense and when you're actually going to pay it. And this is where that, that changes it because you want to know exactly how much cash you have in the bank. That's critical, right? You need to know about the cash. So how does a balance sheet line up? What are the, what are the assets? assets? And, then liability. And, then equity. and equity. Excellent. And that's called the accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. And basically these two, these two things are how you raise money, right? And those, that combination of liabilities and equity is how you fund or pay for your assets. Simple, right? 
So what are the, what are the parts of the uh, income statement? And what's on the bottom? Revenue minus expenses is? Uh, net. net income. Net income. And we can also call that earnings or profit. A lot of times with, uh, again, with public companies, you'll see um, one of the metrics that they use. Um, and next week, we'll talk about ratios a little bit. And ratios are where you put one number over another number on these financial statements. And that basically takes out the scale of the company. So you can compare little companies to big companies or companies over time you know, to themselves longitudinally. Um, so we'll talk about ratios. But one of the big ratios is called uh, EPS. Anybody ever hear that? Earnings per share. You've heard, heard that? Earnings per share. And what earnings per share basically is, is the net income divided by how many shares are outstanding, how much stock is outstanding. So say if a company had um, net income of $1 million and it had 10 million shares outstanding, that would be EPS of what? 10 cents? Yeah, 0.1. Right? And so you'll see these numbers, you know, uh, EPS for earnings per share for, for Microsoft or earnings per share for Google or all those kind of things. And next... Next uh, Monday, I think we'll look at some, uh, some public company 10Ks and look at some real financial statements and look at the complexity of all the stuff, but, but sort of get it down to what these things are so you can sort of get through the, oh my gosh, look at how crazy they are. So we'll look at those on Monday, on Monday and then Wednesday we'll look at ratios and performance stuff and then also uh, just do a, uh, a uh, summary. And I think we'll go over this stuff each week, and, you know, a couple times, and then it'll start to it'll start to sink in. And again, this is the basis for our accounting courses, and then our basis for uh, finance course too. When you think about those kind of things, right? Accounting is a retrospective function, right? By retrospective, I mean it's like a rearview mirror, right? You're looking backwards. It's like what happened over time, right? It's either looking backwards or it's looking at what happened currently, right? What's, what's going on now with the balance sheet? But this is what happened over the last quarter, what happened over the last year. So you're always looking backwards, right, with accounting. Or up to present day with a balance sheet that would be at the, that current day, right? Then with finance, finance, we're looking forward, right? We're looking, we do... Uh, we do uh, forward count, you know, pro forma forecasts of how much revenue we're going to have and all those kind of things. Um, we do net present value. We do all these kind of present value and future value of cash flows, discounting cash flows. And we're looking basically at what the net, net income is this year and what we think it's going to be next year and the year after that and the year after that and the year after that. So we're using income statements that are pro forma. They're just uh, projections, right? And then we're taking all those numbers and bringing those back to today's dollars, and that's how we find the value of the company or something, or whether a project's worth doing or not. Say if you're going to make a billion dollar uh, uh, nuclear power plant or something, uh, or natural gas power plant, um, then you'd have to know how much income are you going to get for that over the time, and what the, how much you're going to discount those future cash flows by, and you want to make sure that that number of those future cash flows discounted back to today is worth more than the billion dollars you're going to have to pay today. And that's called net present value. That's a big, in finance, a big uh, calculation. It's the gold standard of uh, finance uh, decision-making tools and analysis. So finance is essentially looking forward, right? A forward-looking function. Where they overlap is financial statements. So that's why we're doing this first, because this is really, you know, the thing you need to know both to understand accounting and finance. Kind of make sense? So now we have our revenue net income, and now we have to do all these, um, the, the accounts receivable that are in here, and the accounts payable that are in here, and the depreciation, 
and the amortization. Now, depreciation is where we take a, say, an equipment, yeah, and, and, and charge it out over time. It might be five years, three years, 10 years. So we say that we're going to use this asset for that amount of time. So we want to make sure that we charge it in a fractional amount for how much we paid for it over that whole time. If it was a pizza oven and we wanted to charge it like we did last week, you know, $10,000 pizza oven, do it over five years, we take a charge $2,000 every year, right? Amortization is the same thing, but amortization is used as a term for uh, where, where these are uh, tangible assets for depreciation. Intangible assets, they call it amortization. So amortization is what you use for patents or copyrights or goodwill, which is uh, uh, the difference between an acquisition price and what the what the book value of the assets are. So those, so we have all these non-cash expenses, all some non-cash revenue. Um, so this number is either overstating or understating cash by those amount of, by those amounts, right? So then the first part of the cash flow statement is net income, and then we do the the we take all our operation stuff and we do all our 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 subtractions and, and additions relative to accounts receivable and accounts payable and changes in those things, right? So I just put a change, delta means a change, right? Just put a change in AR, AP, and depreciation, right? And then there's two other parts of the cash flow statement. Do you remember what those are? They don't show up up here, and that's why we put them down here. One is investing. So we have operations and we have investing. So if you buy that pizza oven or if you buy that truck, it doesn't show up as an expense here. It shows up as a, a, a taking out of cash down here. And then you're going to put it on the balance sheet as an asset, right, and depreciate it over how many years. So that's where, that, that's where those kind of uh, expenses are shown up. Used to be that you would expense computers, right? Computers would have a lifetime of three or five years. And so back in the 1980s or 1990s, companies would buy computers, they'd put them as an investment, they'd put them on their balance sheet, and then they'd you know, depreciate them over three or five years. Nowadays, because computers have, first of all, they only cost $1,000 or $2,000, and they last maybe 18 months you know, before they're obsolete, a lot of companies expense the computers. You know, they just put in expense for that year and don't even worry about what they call capitalizing it and making it into a, uh, an asset that you're going to then depreciate. What's the last one then? If this is the way money goes out into your equipment and furniture and buildings and all that stuff, what would you call the money that might come in? That's not revenues. Um, no, please say, yep, not profit though, finance. So that's, say, if you uh, got, if you did a, a bank loan, right? And the bank loan was for $10 million, and that would come in through, and you do it through your, you know, it's going into your bank account, but it's not really revenue, right? You didn't sell anything for it. And sometimes revenue is called revenue, sometimes it's called sales. Yeah. There's lots of names for all these things, right? And this can be called the income statement or the P&L, the profit and loss statement. Lots of companies do many income statements uh, for each division. You know, you really want to know what each division's doing, what each department's doing, maybe what each store is doing. So sometimes if you're a manager, one of the big, one of the big things you can get, you know, as a, as a manager is when you get what they call P&L responsibilities, when you actually have responsibilities for an income statement for profit and loss for a certain division or a store or something like that, that's like a, you know, that's, that's, when, that's when you really have responsibility, called P&L responsibilities. So finance is the section of the, of the cash flow statement where money coming in. You might have sold stock. You sold 10 million shares of stock for a dollar a share, $10 million came in, right? It didn't come into sales, but it did come into the company and it's gonna go into your bank account, so you gotta show it somewhere, so you show it there. So at the end of all these adjustments, down here is that beautiful number called cash, right? So that's why people say, and that's a tricky kind of thing, you know, if you ever get asked on an interview question or something like that is, uh, what's the difference between profit and cash? Is there a difference between profit and cash? Well, now you know, you can say, right? You know, profit 
net income is a measure of sales and what happened during the term, but cash, you have to add back all the, all the different uh, non-cash expenses and revenues and investments you made in the finance and then you get, you know, the cash flow statement, the bottom line of the cash flow statement is cash. So then what we do to make these numbers all match up, we'd have our changes over here in accounts receivable, right, would show up and our changes in accounts payable and all that and, and our, our new depreciation for that year and stuff would be on here too and all. So these two sides need to balance again, right? So the way that we do that is this number here, the net income number, that goes into equity here as retained earnings. And then that number is different though than cash. And then this number gets added to cash, which is the top asset line on our, because it's the most liquid on our balance sheet. And that's how these add up. And then between this cash number and that retained earnings and the differences between the two being these adjustments here, because those adjustments are showing up on the balance sheet, it all balances out in theory. But sometimes it takes the accountants a long time because you really have to look at the bank account and say, okay, how much do we have in the bank? Is it this number plus this number? Is that what's on our bank statement? And if it's not, then you gotta go back and see where you made a mistake and all, you know. One more little, little glitch in here that I'll tell you is, um, ever hear of dividends? Some companies pay dividends, right? What a dividend is, is they pay some of this net income each year to the shareholders, to the owners, right? And owners like that. They get a little money, right? Um, so sometimes not all of this will go into retained earnings. Some of it may go as a dividend. So in those cases, you see another little financial statement that's just the net income minus the dividends and then what goes into retained earnings. So. Uh, usually companies that are more mature pay a dividend and it might be that the stock costs $10 a share and you might get a dividend of a dollar a share. That'd be pretty good. That means you'd be getting a 10% return each year. Usually it's more like two or 3% because stocks also, a lot of them bank on that they're going to be growing over time. And so the stock price will appreciate. So you might get some return through dividends and some through capital gains when you sell it for a higher price than you bought it for. Um, but then there's companies like, say, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, companies that are rapidly growing, Amazon, that can still take all this money, they say, and plow it back into retained earnings because they can plow it into more business and capture more market share and make their company bigger. Then they have better opportunities to make that money grow than giving it to the, to back to the shareholders. Companies that get more mature, they're not growing as fast, you know, shareholders will, will um, agitate for getting a dividend because they say, give us that money back. We can make, we can allocate that money in the market more efficiently than you can in the company at this point. So that's usually the argument for dividends. The way that this is set up, right, it's not like I had on the board. I have the two balance sheets next to each other, and then we have the income statement and the cash flow statement over here, right? Um, so we start with 2016, um, and the, the first number was basically, the yellows were, were the ones that you had to fill in the blanks. So how do you fill in the blanks for that first number? You basically just, all of that stream of numbers there, 500, 232, 123, and whatever that blank was, had to add up to the, to the 1275, right? So. The way that I, I did it on here was you, um, see that number basically has that formula in it, but it, it's just, you just, it, it, all these numbers are in accounting, you just call them plugs, right? You know, if you know all the other numbers, you know what that number is going to be. And the only information we need as we go through this is up top here where I say, Accounts receivable increased by $75 throughout the year, right? So that, that's really the only piece of information we need to solve all of these numbers. So we get that 420. Now we have all of those numbers. Now we can do the total assets, right? We just add up. Now we don't add up again. You don't double count the 500 and the, and the 232, right? You take the 1275 and you add that to the 747 and the 711 and that adds up to that number. Right, that adds up to the, the 
33. And now the liabilities and equity are going to have to add up to that same number. Right? So we start off again. We know that the total current liabilities is 264. And the only number that we have to figure out is that one that was in the yellow box. So we subtract those other two ones from 264, and we come up with 101. Right? And so you can see current liabilities are accounts payable, you know, your accrued liabilities, the, the, um, the, well, how much on, a, on, the, on, the, on your note payable, your, your loan, you're going to have to pay within that year. That's the 71. So then, then we have our long-term liabilities, right? And we just, in this case, just have one, the bonds, you know, a bond, right? Bonds payable. So then the total liabilities are the current liabilities plus the bond, the long-term liabilities. That turns out to be 1237, 1237. And then we, then we go down to the, the, the shareholders' equity part, and we see that, uh, as I said, there's the, the common stock. That's how much was originally put into the, into the uh, company. And then retained earnings is that number that, over the years, all the net income that keeps getting added to it. Those two numbers together give you a shareholders' equity of 1496, right? So 1496 and 1237, add those two numbers up, and you get that 2733. And then you can see that those two numbers add up. So now we've done that first year's balance sheet, right? And so now we're going to go over to the, the income statement. And also, when you look at, um, especially in big companies, you'll see that they, they take off the zeros off the numbers just so you don't have tons of zeros. And it'll say in thousands or in millions of dollars. Um, and so you'd know that the numbers are, um, that they're actually larger numbers, but they just take off the zero, so it just makes it easier to read, right? So there you have your, your sales and your service revenue. So in this, in this company, there's two lines that they break out the, the, the sales in, or the revenues, right? So total revenues is just adding up those two numbers. Now we're going to go through and do our expenses. And the first expense is what they call a above-the-line expense, are what they call COGS. And COGS stands for cost of goods sold. And if it's a service company, say a consulting firm or something, uh, then it might be called uh, COS, cause, uh, cost of services. And those are the expenses that line up directly with the making of the product or the, or the delivery of the service, right? So that would be, say for a product, it would be the materials that go into it and the labor. Those, those things are pretty much the cost. But, it, it, but then there's also interpretations of what you put into COGS and what you don't. Do you put the supervisor of the, of the, of the factory in there? Do you put other, other types of costs, or do you put those outside of it as overhead for the whole business? Um, because then you have the, you know, the executives and the H &R, HR department and uh, the accounting department and uh, the IT department. All those kind of things are just general expenses. And they go below as SG&A, the selling, general, and administrative. And then sometimes you also break out R&D as a separate expense, too. Those are what they call below the line kind of expenses. So once again, we have those expenses. We know what the total expenses are. And we're just missing that one line, right? And so that's 505. When you, when you add up the others and subtract it from the 3034, three, you're going to get the, the plug number of 505. Um, so you have all these, 1492, 983, 54, and 3. So if you, if you added up the 1492, the 983, and the 54, right, and subtracted them from 3034, you'll get the 505, right? So it's just, it's basically saying these have to, uh, that column has to add up to 3034. So what's the number that's missing? That's what most of these numbers are, is that kind of thing. So then this pre-tax income is what? It's the 3372, the revenues minus the expenses. That's your income, right? That's the net income. And then what do we have to do? We have to pony up some money to uh, the government, right? And so in this case, I kind of switched this around here and said, OK, if the pre-tax income is 338 and the taxes that you pay is 74, then what's the tax rate? And how would you figure that out? Exactly. 74 divided by 338 
it gives you 22, 22%. Um, so that, I mean, usually you'd get what the tax rate is and then you calculate, but I, I thought I'd make it kind of, you know, interesting for you. So then you have net income of 264, right? So far, everything, you got everything going? Okay, now I'm going to move down here. Now we go into the cash flow statement, right? And what's the, the, the first line in the cash flow statement is the bottom line of the income statement. So 264 is pulling that number down. And now we knew that accounts receivable increased by $75, right? So if accounts receivable increased by $75, that means that our sales number was overstated by 75, right? Because that's from a cash standpoint, that's it's in our revenues, but we didn't get the cash yet. It's in it's in accounts receivable. So now we have to subtract that amount from that net income number to get to the cash number. That's the key. That's the that's a key point. Does it make sense that way? Yeah. Right. So it because it because it's overstating revenue, it's overstating the net income. So you have to take it out. What if accounts payable went up by seventy five? Then we would have we would have overstated expenses by seventy five, right? Because that's accounts payable. Say we got to pay the electric bill at seventy five, um, but we didn't pay it yet. We have it as an expense, but it didn't come out of cash yet. So our cash number, it, then our expenses are higher than really the cash that we've spent. So then we want to we would want to take and add back the accounts payable. So in this case, that's what that's saying. The increase in accounts payable um, needs to be added. In. So when you when you take out those numbers, right? These numbers almost cancel each other out by seven bucks, right? 75 and 82. So this 171 is just uh, seven dollars higher than that, right? Seven million. Hmm? Seven million, that's right. It's real money now, right? It's not just seven dollars. But that's the thing. When you're working in a big company, you know, you think about, oh my gosh, these numbers are huge, you know, five billion or seven hundred million or whatever. But you know what? It's the same as seven dollars or seventy dollars. It's just more zero. So all of the analysis is really, really still the same. But you're right. Seven million dollars. That's still real money in my mind. So then we don't, we, I, I didn't want to conf, confuse things with investing and financing activities, but those are the other parts of the cash flow statement, right? If we had bought a truck for 10, we would have put that minus 10 there. If we would have sold stock for 10, we would have put a, you know, 10 coming in there, right? So there's the 71. Our beginning cash was what number? That's, that's over here, right? Our beginning cash is this number up top there, 500, right? Beginning of the year. So the beginning cash So this cash flow plus the beginning cash gives us this number. So that's our cash number now. So that number, then we'd go to our bank account and say, "Okay, how much is in our actually in our bank?" Oh, 70 71. Oh, thank goodness we we did it right. Because that, that's called reconciling. You have to reconcile these numbers then to the actual cash in the bank. So now we just plug that number in up top there, 771, right? So now once again, and we know that accounts receivable went up by 82, right? Because it tells us that here. So you have to add that to the accounts, you know, the, the, uh, well, I'm sorry, the, the accounts receivable went up by 75, so you have to add that. That's what that 232 plus 75 is 237. Uh, 307, sorry. Understand that? Yeah. You look a little confused. That's where I was confused. Kind of, I was trying to get my head around because you, you got the accounts receivable factored in the, in the cash flow. Right, but you also have it, you also have it actually on the balance sheet too right. because it, it's 
And it's that, it's that change in accounts receivable that has to see if you have it there, then you also, it'll show up in the net income number and then it'll show up in the, in the cash flow as different. And because you're putting those, those are two different numbers now you're putting on in the retained earnings and into the cash. And so that takes that into account. So you have to show that there. Same thing with the accounts payable, right? The accounts payable goes from 101 to 183. Why is that? Because we were given here, it goes up by 82. So we have the, we have the, the cash number of 771. We add the $75 for the increase in accounts payable from the 232 of the previous year to make it 307. So now we have all the numbers that we can add up, the 420 and the 123. We add up those four numbers, we get the 1621. Right. Then we can take that 1621 and the other two numbers there, the 747 and the 711, and we know that the total assets are now 3079. Down below, accounts payable goes from 101 to 183 because accounts payable went up by 82. Now we have those three numbers, and we can add those up to get the total current liability, so we get 346. Add that to our bond, and we get 1319, right? Now we go to common stock, still the same number, but retained earnings has gone up. Well, how much is retained earnings going up by? It has gone up by net income, right? So you add the net income to the retained earnings, and it goes from 656 to 920. So now we know those two numbers together for the total shareholders' equity, 840, 920 equals 1760. And so then the 1319 and the 1760, we add those together. And voila, we get 3079. Yeah, definitely try it again because then, in fact, try it again. I'd encourage you to try it again and you'll probably stumble somewhere through it. But then that'll be another point where come in on Monday and tell me, I got to this part and I forgot what the heck we did here. And then we'll go through it again and let's and do it a couple times until you really, you know, until we really get it. Did anybody look at that other little video I sent? It's sort of a, a lo-fi version of it's an electronic whiteboard thing. It's a same it's the same as this going through the asset balance sheet income statement. Well, that's another way to remember that. So pretty good, huh? This is a good way to kind of I I find to kind of teach us. And believe me. If you can understand this even just vaguely, but if you can really get it, you know, then you're really rocking and rolling. There's not too many people that understand this. I was a public company CFO for years, and I, for a few years, I really didn't totally get this, you know, until you know, just going through and doing it over and over. So there's, it might be only the CFO of your company or something, or the real you know, numbers people really get this and nobody else does. So this can really give you a, a leg up when you understand this and you can look at financials and see how they go together. And then when you look at all the different line items, because real financials are, they have a lot more, you know, sort of detail. And so, but these are the, the main kind of, uh, the main categories, main line, line items. So then you can start asking questions. And that's really the key because all of these, a lot of these things are based on estimates and assumptions and there's biases in those numbers. And you need, you know, if you can go and ask, well, how did you come to this number? What, you know, and, and all that stuff's supposed to be detailed in footnotes too, in notes to the numbers. But a lot of times those can be kind of vague. And, uh, and to get to the point where you're not shy to say, I don't really get this number. And, and have somebody explain it to you until it's clear, you know. Yeah, you That's went, really a thing to get over. As hmm? you went through it, I just was typing notes by the ones that I had, you know, had trouble to figure out where did that number originate. For example, beginning cash, that comes from the previous prior year. The 500? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the, that was the beginning cash, plus you're going to put the cash from this year, and those two things then make the cash for, for next year. Well, next, you know what I'll send you? Uh, I'll send you tomorrow is, um, I'll send you another one of these sort of uh, blank ones like this, and I'll send you this one with all the answers because each one of these cells have how the answers are derived. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, every one of these, I just have the 
where the number's pulled from or something. So then you, you'll really have an idea of, oh, okay, that's where it's from. So that'll be very helpful going forward. It's the what? Is it like a standard sheet? Like, is it, is it changeable? Or there's something will be changed and there's a trick maybe or something? No. That's going to happen? This is, what, this is the way any accounting will be done. And because all accounting pretty much has to be done by, I mean, if it's done right, it has to be done by GAAP, which is those general accept, generally accepted accounting principles. And those say, this is how you lay it out. You know, yeah. Um, you lay out. Now, there'll be different um, line items depending on what kind of assets the company has, what kind of expenses, what kind of revenues, where they come from, all that kind of stuff. But uh, this will be the general format of every, every company. It has to be this way. Yep. So um, knowing this, yeah, you can, it's a template, you know, that, uh, that, 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 it be, that every company will be this way. You're going to have a balance sheet, an income statement, a cash flow statement. And they, the, the cash flow statement will always have the operations section, then the investing section, then the financing section. The income statement is always going to have revenue or sales, whatever they're calling on top, all the expenses, all the costs in the middle, and then the net income, profit, or the in, in, uh, sometimes in nonprofits they'll call that surplus or deficit instead of net income or loss. And the balance sheet always has the assets and always has the liabilities equity. And those assets always have to equal the liabilities and equity. That's the the accounting equation, which is just the, the you know the, the number one golden rule. And they all, uh, have, you know, the guy, the rule is that they all have to you know comply with the matching principle, which is when when the revenue hits the expenses, you want to line those those up. And so and there's you know there's sometimes there's uh, interpretation about when actually a sale is made. Um, you know, because a lot of companies might, if you're a, say if you're a software company and you sell the software and then you actually implement the software in a company, it might take six months to, to do that whole process. When do you book the revenue? You know, all these kind of, there's some kind of, or do you do it partially based on milestones or there's, so there's interpretations that happen along the way. And a lot of companies will Sometimes if, they, if they're not meeting their quarterly objectives, maybe they'll try to book some revenues quicker or reduce or push some expenses out. The problem is once you start playing that game, you know, you're always catching up. It's like a Ponzi scheme in a way, right? If you, if you book a whole bunch of revenues now that maybe you should have booked later, and that might make you numbers for this quarter, but then next quarter, all those revenues you could have had, they're not going to be there, so then you have to scramble harder to get more revenue. You know, so it's, you, get a, you get into a, uh, a, um, a treadmill that's just impossible to then catch up with. So it's not a good idea to do that, but lots of companies have, uh, have done that. Um, one company did that was waste management. Waste management, ever hear of them? They were a big um, garbage company. They, they do the garbage here in Albuquerque, right? And what they did was, brilliant thing, they, in the in the 80s you know, and 70s, there was a whole bunch of what they call roll-ups, where they would consolidate a lot of regional businesses in lots of different industries, right? There were all these sort of mom and pop kind of uh, businesses, and then companies would go and acquire all those and make a big national company. And then when they were a national company, they could reduce costs because they didn't have all, all these companies operating separately, right? They could you know, centralize accounting and HR and all these different functions. And, and have more purchasing power to buy their equipment and all. So waste management was growing and growing as they rolled up all these garbage companies. Interesting business too, because a lot of the garbage companies, I don't know if you know about the garbage business, but uh, it used to be very uh, mob oriented. It was like mafia business, right? It was the garbage business. So rolling those businesses up was an interesting kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, right, that's it. And, so they did that, and as they were growing and acquiring all these companies, they were growing, it was a darling of Wall Street. And so, but then once they started to mature and acquire all the companies nationally, they started moving into other businesses, and they really weren't as good at operating those businesses as they were as, as operating the garbage business, the waste disposal business. So they weren't, their, their net income was starting to get lower. 
So what they started to do was they looked and they said, oh my gosh, we have 120,000 garbage trucks and we're depreciating those on seven year schedules or 10 year schedules. Those trucks really can last 15 years or whatever, right? So what happens if, say if you, you know, if you, if you took a, a five year depreciation schedule and then made it a 10 year depreciation schedule, then you're only taking half the depreciation each year, right? So you're taking half the expense, so then the net income looks better, right? And so they started doing shenanigans like that. And they got all caught up in doing that for a long time. And then finally it caught up with them and they had to take like a $3.4 billion one-time charge because of all this bad stuff they had done in the past, you know, mismanagement stuff. So they doubled the life of the garbage trucks? They doubled the life, yeah, so they half the, half the depreciation and that bumped up the net income, but after a while, and they did a whole bunch of shenanigans like that. So there's pressure on companies to maybe, you know, sometimes play with the numbers uh, to meet performance goals that may or may not be uh, the way they should do it. Some, but there is art in here too. It, it, some of this stuff's not illegal. You know, you can do it, but then it might catch up with you because it's not good management practice as well. Do private companies use the fiscal year at all? Like well, to... private companies use fiscal year. A lot of, like um, governments, I think Albuquerque is on a, a, a year that ends September 30th. And then there's other companies, some nonprofits do uh, June 30th, you know, at the middle of June. Wh when is yours, do you know? September, in two weeks. You do, so that's the end of your year. And the one of the reasons, they, it, there's no rhyme or reason to it other than a lot of times you can get better accounting prices because uh, the accountants are so busy with all the ones that end at the end of the year through April that September is a, a slower time for them, so they'll give you a better deal to do your accounting. That's really what, uh, the only reason I can see to do it. And and the government works on a September 30. So if you're if you're getting government money, you want to match up with their year. That that's that's all. So that gets all confusing. You got some at, at different different times. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and companies, you can pick, you can pick whenever, whenever you want to do it, you know. But most companies do it on the calendar year. And even then, you know, they, they, companies will maybe pick one of the other quarters, like the end of March, the end of June, the end of September. I don't know, you know, companies don't pick like... Uh, August 13th is going to be the end of our fiscal year or something like that. It's not that random. Now that you've seen it done, you know there's no magic to it. It's basically just, and you really got to step through the numbers kind of in sequence. That's, that's the key that I tried to do with putting these numbers together, right, is you have to start over at that first balance sheet, do that. Then you have to go through the net, in, you know, the income statement. Then you have to go through the cash flow, and then you can come back and do the second year, second year um, balance sheet. And a lot of times, when you see these numbers in 10Ks, and we'll look at those, they usually give you last year and this year next to each other too, so you can see, you know, how they how they performed. Absolutely, that's accounting. And so what we're doing now is the high level picture of accounting to give you the, the big picture, the context, and then, then we'll fill in the details in the accounting course. Yes, what you start with in accounting is basically, yeah, you have a general ledger that has all the different accounts. And every company is different because you have different vendors and different you know, payrolls and everything is different. So you make up this ledger of accounts and in each ledger of accounts, Every bill that comes in that, or every sale that you make or whatever, you have to figure out what account that is going to be charged against. So if it's your you know, electric bill, then you have an electric account. If it's your you know, uh, office supplies, and you might even break that down into a lot more detail, but you'd have an office supply account. And then the, the magic of accounting is, and it was, it was basically invented in about 500 years ago, and that's what actually one of the things that made the Renaissance was the Italians in Florence invented double entry bookkeeping, where you have a debit and a credit, and those balance each other out. And so you have two accounts that 
one gets charged and one you know, gets, the, gets the money, goes up and one goes down basically. And one of the reasons I think they did that was because at that time, we weren't hip to the, you know, the, the Middle Eastern, the zero. We didn't have zero. So that's the way they made a zero was by having two entries, a plus and a minus that made a zero kind of. But that, that ledger system became, it was like a secret intellectual property that made the banking families of Florence, the Medici's and the, and the PT family and these guys, uh, masters of Europe. I mean, all the money came through there uh, because they knew how to do this secret kind of uh, banking and they were willing to make notes of transfer around Europe. And so they had the money so that they basically uh, had the money to fund the Renaissance. And that's where, you know, Western Civ came back. All from accounting. So yeah, when we get into accounting, we'll go into debits and credits and, and accounts and then those aggregate up into a general ledger and then that general ledger gets reconciled and, uh, and then ultimately, that's what builds up these financial statements. Yeah, so it's incredibly detailed. Every invoice you get, every receipt, you know, those kind of things get put into files and, uh, and there's a check, you know, stapled to that, that invoice and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and you, you split up those responsibilities because you don't want to have one person having all those responsibilities because then, there's, then there could be fraud because then they could start taking money. And, uh, You'd be surprised. There's still a lot of, you know, I mean, look in your own life, right? How much stuff, you know, maybe everything, but you still have some paper. A lot of things still come in paper, but not as much as used to. I um, mean, it used to be if you had an audit, the auditors would show up, you'd put them in your conference room, they'd be there for a week, and they would be doing test work, and they'd say, Give me the file on this transaction, and give me the file on this transaction, and you'd have to have all the files of, you know, here's this transaction, and here's the, you know, here's the invoice, here's the check stub attached to that, and here's the whole, all the paperwork that went with that, and that's what they look for. And they, they don't look at everything, they have to start, they do sample testing and, you know, sort of uh, uh, do enough sampling testing that they feel comfortable that everything's been done right. But nowadays, um, Audit, audits can be done from afar. They can just get into your QuickBooks or whatever and start looking at stuff. You can email them the, 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 the background, you know, the, the backup information, and uh, they don't have to come out on site. So, yeah, things have changed quite a bit. Yeah, and you want to have separation of duties in those different type of ways. If the person that opens the mail is not the person that cuts the checks, is not the person that puts the stuff into the system, uh, because you want to have separation of duty. That, that's, it's part of fraud prevention. Um, but it doesn't, you know, mean that maybe three people don't get together in the company and say, hey, you know, right. if we all work together, we can split. <laughs> so there's always, uh, you can have fraud prevention, but you never are 100 percent, you know, there's not going to be any fraud at all. But yeah, so, so you've, you've had experience with that kind yeah, of thing. Mm -hmm. But that's why I think that's why this is better um, when people have experience and know what they don't know, then you can say, oh, okay, you know, uh, now I don't have to have that hole in my knowledge and be intimidated by this, these numbers and I can actually participate and, and ask those kind of questions of the CFO and then know where I fit in in the scheme of this. If, am I adding to, you know, to efficiency or am I sort of just a cost center and all that kind of stuff, you know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we'll go through that in, in accounting in, in more detail. And again, you know, accounting is a, is a, a pretty detailed subject. So obviously, we're not going to learn it all and, you know, not going to be a CPA in two weeks. But, uh, but you can know enough that you can ask more informed questions. And then over time, you know, you get to really, really understand these things. And, uh, and most companies are really happy, you know, when they understand because a lot of times there's that dichotomy right it's like the one side of the company that's operations or marketing and stuff and then the bean counters are always coming down on us man and not letting us spend money and uh, 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 you know and but then when you understand the financial constraints 
sometimes you know you can actually negotiate better and get what you want or whatever, or at least understand why there's a rationale for it's not just arbitrary that you know you can't go on this junket to wherever Hawaii. But this is the key. This is the thing. NBA ASAP. Same.